great pleasure to introduce Andrew Butterfield, who is the curator of our great exhibition up on the main floors, Verrocchio, sculptor and painter of Renaissance Florence. Uh, Andrew Butterfield received his PhD in art history from the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University, writing his dissertation on the sculptures of Andrea del Verrocchio. He went on to transform that dissertation into a monograph on the subject that won the very prestigious Mitchell Prize for the best book in art history written in 1997. His work as a scholar did not stop there. All the while he was launching his career as an independent art dealer, securing major works of European art, uh, especially sculpture for the finest museums and private collections. Uh, he went on to continue to be a prolific scholar. He's the author of more than 100 articles and books on topics ranging from Fra Angelico to Picasso. And he's also become a regular writer for the New York Review of Books, where he's gained a devoted following uh, of people who appreciate his ability to distill complex subjects in inviting accessible terms, just as he's done for us with Andrea del Ferrocchio. Uh, before I bring Andrew up onto the stage, uh, I just want to mention briefly that we have a related exhibition on the photographs by the professor from Smith College, Clarence Kennedy, that is open specially today, uh, that is on view in our library, which you can see after the, uh, the, the lecture. You obviously want to visit Andrea del Verrocchio, but we also have a, a, another Renaissance sculpture painting drawing exhibition on view, uh, on the, uh, Alonso Berrigete, first sculptor of Renaissance Spain. So a lot to be done after we listen to uh, Andrew Butterfield. Uh, thank you, C.D., for that very kind introduction. Um, when I look out at the audience today, it's a great pleasure to see uh, friends and colleagues from all over America and from all over Europe and from all parts of the art world. So in the audience, uh, we have uh, curators and professors, collectors and dealers, and many other people who love the arts. And I um, want to begin with just asking the question, what is it about Verrocchio that um, brought us all together today? And um, especially since uh, Verrocchio, for many of us in the modern world, seems an enigmatic figure. If he, he's not terrifically famous, he's not a household name, and if people know of him, they think of him generally as the teacher of Leonardo as the master who was superseded and surpassed by his pupil. But in his own day, uh, Verrocchio was considered uh, a, a the, the greatest sculptor um, of his generation. And this reputation uh, as being the supreme sculptor continued um, for at least 100 years. Uh, for example, when his tomb of Piero de' Medici and Giovanni de' Medici, so Lorenzo de' Medici's father and uncle, when Verrocchio's tomb for them was unveiled around 1472, it was declared to be one of the wonders of the world. It was said to be a work of new artistry and of miraculous technical ability. And uh, it was praised in these terms throughout the 16th century. Similarly, when his great sculpture of Christ and St. Thomas was unveiled in 1483, it was said to be the most beautiful thing there is and to be the most beautiful portrait of Christ ever made. And it went on being hailed in these terms throughout the 16th century. It was praised for its supreme beauty and said to be a work of unsurpassable craftsmanship in its casting and chasing. Other works that Verrocchio made as a sculptor were also groundbreaking. So he, when he made this statue of David for the Medici around 1465, it was the first statue, bronze statue in the round in Florence to be uh, sculpted and cast by the same artist because unlike many other sculptors, Verrocchio was also a great bronze caster and at a time when bronze casting was still in its infancy as it was being revived as a major medium for the arts in the Renaissance after falling into 
disuse for hundreds of years following the decline of the Roman Empire. His statue, his bust of a lady with flowers, made about 1475, so about 10 years after the David, was also a work of groundbreaking character. It is the first Renaissance portrait bust to include the arms and hands of the sitter, and it is also the first sculpture we have in the Renaissance, which very clearly is a embodiment of a poem or of poetry, of poetic imagery, because in Lorenzo de' Medici, uh, in particular, uh, liked writing poetry, which celebrated the hands of his beloved and described them holding flowers. And this bus is almost certainly a, a embodiment of that poetic ideal. About 1480, he made, also for the Medici, for one of their gardens, a statue of a poodle with a dolphin, and this was the first work to be designed to be equally beautiful from every viewpoint as you move around it. So the composition as you move around it continually changes and continually resolves itself into a new and beautiful and compelling composition. The last work that Verrocchio was uh, making when he died in 1488 was the sculpture of Bartolomeo Colleone, a general of the Venetian army, and this was only the third bronze equestrian statue to be made since antiquity, and it was the first to show the horse in vivid motion, and in particular to show the horse with one leg raised off the ground, and this was a miracle of uh, technology at the time. The bronze of the horse weighs many tons, and yet he was able to show it without one support on the ground. He was also a significant painter who worked a lot for the Medici and for other patrons. And his two most famous paintings are the Baptism of Christ, which he began sometime around 1470 and uh, perhaps never finished, and uh, was made with the collaboration of young Leonardo da Vinci, who made the angel at the extreme left, and also worked on the body and face of Christ, and on the landscape in the back at the left. On the right screen, we see another painting by him, which was made, started sometime in the mid-1470s, and completed sometime in the mid-1480s, and was also a Medici commission, and was for a church in Pistoia and is known as the Madonna di Piazza. And this painting he made with another assistant of his, a man named Lorenzo de Credi. In addition, Verrocchio was a great worker in gold and silver. And on the left, we have this astonishing relief of uh, the beheading of St. John the Baptist, made entirely in silver. And on the right, we have a agate cup with mounts that Verrocchio made in the 1480s, which you can see in the exhibition upstairs. He also was a woodworker, and I believe, as do others, that he made the door of the old sacristy. The bronze handles of the doors are certainly by Verrocchio, and the doors very likely are as well. And he was also a great draftsman, the greatest draftsman of his generation, and a great innovator as, as a draftsman. On the left, we see the most brilliant example of his work in pen and ink, and on the right, a drawing by him in black chalk, which was a medium that he was incredibly innovative in, and we'll discuss a little bit more in, uh, later in the lecture. But Verrocchio was also the greatest teacher of his generation, one of the greatest teachers, perhaps, in the history of art. Most famously, he was the teacher of Leonardo. And you see the baptism of Christ, which we've seen already, and the Ginevra de Benci, which is upstairs. He also was the teacher to Pietro Perugino. And if you look at the painting on the right, you can see the connection in the face and the paint, the, the drawing of the face and the painting of the face and arm with one of the angels in the beautiful painting of the Madonna and Child with two angels from London, which is in the exhibition. He was also a teacher to Domenico Ghirlandaio, 
we have clear documentary evidence that they were friends, and Gerland Io seems to have worked for him as a young man and drew motifs from Verrocchio's work uh, throughout his career. And it is very likely that Verrocchio was also a teacher and employer of Botticelli when Botticelli was a very young man, um, around 1468 or so. So important was Verrocchio as a teacher that when the walls of the Sistine Chapel were frescoed in 1480, this fresco cycle here and here, that includes these two walls, three of the four artists were former pupils of Verrocchio. So when they make the most important fresco cycle in uh, Italy of its time, they turn to the former pupils of Verrocchio. And you can see by uh, looking at some of the elements of the paintings, how impactful Verrocchio's style was on the painters that followed him. If you look at the drapery, for example, or if you look at the kind of the drama, the tension that is uh, described between the figures. So important was Verrocchio as a teacher of painters that around 1508, the pupil of, of Lorenzo de' Medici's children was a, in a text on the city of Florence writes that Verrocchio was the fountain from which painters draw everything that is good. So he was in his own day and shortly thereafter seen as this major source of um, the, new, the new way in the arts. But his impact on the visual arts didn't, as a teacher and as a model did not end with the, his, his own pupils or it, with, his own, with the, the, the painters in his, who came immediately afterwards. As you all know, in the early 16th century in Florence, there was a great flowering of the arts, which we call the High Renaissance. And the three major figures in painting in the High Renaissance are uh, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and uh, Raphael. And as we've already seen, Verrocchio was the teacher of Leonardo. And he was the teacher of Gerlandio, who was the teacher of Michelangelo. And you can see the, how Verrocchio's model, uh, example, remained relevant to Michelangelo 50 years later. Because it was Verrocchio who created this idea of black chalk heads of idealized women. And there is Michelangelo continuing that tradition uh, 50 years later. And the third artist that Verrocchio deeply influenced was Raphael. Raphael was trained by Perugino, so he was trained by a uh, pupil of Verrocchio, and Raphael's father actually wrote a poem in which he talks about the artists in Florence, and he describes Verrocchio as the bridge to painting and sculpture. So when Raphael comes to Florence in the early 16th century, we all know that he turned to Leonardo and wanted to find out what was going on, and what Leonardo was doing, but he was also very much looking at Raphael, as you can see in this comparison of the uh, altarpiece on the right by Raphael and the altarpiece on the left by Verrocchio. How did this come about? What were some of the conditions that enabled Verrocchio to be such an uh, innovative and impactful artist? And one thing you have to know is that at the time of Verrocchio's youth and training, Florence was in the middle of the greatest boom in its history, a uh, boom in building of arch new architecture and a uh, boom in the, in the patronage of the arts. And so, for example, three of the major churches of Florence were all under construction at the time. So San Lorenzo, the Medici church, was being built in the 1450s and 60s. The uh, lantern of the uh, Duomo was being finished. And in fact, the ball at the very top, the gilded ball, was originally by Verrocchio, completed in 1469. And the facade of Santa Maria Novella was being fi finished. But many other churches were also being built at the same time. So the entire city was under construction. Similarly, there was a boom in the building of private palaces and villas and there was an enormous demand 
for artists and architects and painters because of this. It was also a great time to be a young artist because so many of the older artists were dying off at the ver in these very years. So, for example, Ghiberti died in 1455, Desiderio died in 1464, and Donatello in 1466. So at the same time that there was this incredible boom in demand, there was a contraction in the people who could supply it. There was another factor, which is that in this period, Florentine artists began making works of art which required the collaboration of unprecedented numbers of artists. And the most famous example is the Cardinal of Portugal Chapel in San Miniato al Monte, made in the 1460s, which involved the efforts of many artists. So over here you have the tomb by Antonio and Bernardo Rossellino. Here you have an altarpiece by Antonio and Piero del Polaiolo. Here you have um, a painting by another artist, Alessio Baldovinetti, and so on. So there was this, there are other artists contributed to this chapel as well. So there was this unprecedented phase of collaboration and cross-fertilization, uh, which encouraged artists to share and, as well as compete with one another. So by the mid-1460s, Verrocchio had become both a painter and a sculptor. Uh, he was trained initially as a goldsmith, but we know that by the early 1460s, he already had a painting workshop, and by the middle of the 1460s, he's already making sculptures for the Medici. Well, how did this come about? We don't know, and we'll never know, unless we make some extraordinary revelation in the, in the archives, we'll never know exactly what the path was that led to this, but we can see some parts of the story that as they come into focus from art historical study. And this, it's, it's almost certain, I think, on the basis of stylistic analysis that Verrocchio was trained by Lippi, the great painter, Florentine painter, Fra Filippo Lippi. And there, there's a lot of evidence of this, but this comparison should uh, help us see why that should be the case. So, uh, Verrocchio continues, picks up this, I, this motif, which was unique to Lippi, of showing a Madonna and child in a landscape, with the child reaching up to grab at the mother, and with this elaborate headdress, with this kind of knot of drapery in it, and this desire to, sh to uh, show the, the translucency of the veil. These are all, all elements that show that were unique to Lippi and which Verrocchio then took up. And so comparisons such as this strongly suggest that Verrocchio was a pupil of Lippi. The only other real option is that Verrocchio was trained with a guy named Pezzolino, and, uh, but we'll never be certain because the best evidence of this is a painting in the National Gallery in London of the Trinity, which was begun by Pezzolino, but then completed by Lippi and his workshop when Pezzolino died. And the, uh, there are some technical elements that suggest it could be by Verrocchio, but the thing that is perhaps most suggestive is the pose of one of the saints, which is virtually identical with that of the David when seen in reverse. As a sculptor, it's possible that Verrocchio initially began carving marble with Desiderio de Sedignano, who certainly hired many sculptors to help him, but it's more likely that the major source of inspiration for Verrocchio was Lorenzo Ghiberti. And some of the things that suggest this are that uh, Lorenzo Ghiberti, throughout his long career, loved hiring young artists who were painters and goldsmiths like Verrocchio to come work in his shop. And then another point is that we actually have a 16th century source which tells us that Verrocchio was in Ghiberti's workshop. Moreover, there is a work planned by Lorenzo Ghiberti and finished by his son, Vittorio Ghiberti, which has an element in it which looks very much like it could be by Verrocchio. And that is on the south side of the baptistry, you have the door 
by Andrea Pisano, and around it, this door frame by Ghiberti, begun in 1455 and finished in 1464. And this figure here is Eve with Cain and Abel, and it is possibly identifiable as the earliest work by Verrocchio. And the reasons to think this are, in part, that there's only one other figure in Florentine art which shows the hand raised, the, the left arm bent at the elbow and with the hand across the chest and with the right arm raised, bent at the elbow and then sort of making a zigzag with the wrist. And that is the Christ and St. Thomas. So there really, there are only two figures in this pose in all of Florentine art, and there, uh, there they are. Moreover, the loose curls of Eve are very similar to the loose curls around Christ's head. So you have that comparison, for example, or this one here, which is you know, quite a lot like that. It makes a very similar pattern. And then the figures of Cain and Abel also have similarities with works by Verrocchio. So here is one of those figures compared to the Puddha with a dolphin. And here is another compared with one of the drawings by Verrocchio. Regardless of where he was trained, a major point of reference for Verrocchio at, throughout his life was Donatello. Uh, there is a book published in 1504 in Florence which tells us that Verrocchio was the emulus of Donatello. And emulus means competitor, but also sort of Im imitator in a rivalrous manner. And we can see that repeatedly. So one example, one perhaps the most famous example, is the David of Verrocchio, which clearly is a response to the David of Donatello, and where Donatello's figure is sort of meditative and languorous, Verrocchio's figure is much more outward looking and seems to be attempting to engage the viewer in a, in a much more direct manner. And they both were made for the Medici. Another important point in his lifelong rivalry with Donatello was Verrocchio's Christ and St. Thomas, which was made for a niche originally designed by Donatello and filled with Donatello's statue of St. Louis of Toulouse. That statue was taken out around 1461, and Verrocchio was hired to fill the niche in January of 1467, exactly one month after the death of Donatello. And so when he went to do that, he wanted to show how he could make better artistic use of the niche than Donatello had. His niche is used to suggest the room in which the miracle took place and therefore is incorporated into the sculpture in a way that's not the case in Donatello's statue. And another important point of rivalry between them was the Coleoni Monument, which is a response to Donatello's Gattamalata Monument. They're both monuments made for the celebration of Venetian generals and approximately 30 miles apart. So in addition to his rivalry with Donatello, a very important point in Verrocchio's artistic ambition was he wanted always to change the boundaries of the uh, categories of sculpture that he took up. He wanted to continually challenge what had been tr previous tradition and invent something new. And one of the examples where we can see this very clearly is in the monument he made for a cardinal in Pistoia. Now, to understand this work, you have to know that it was uh, horribly damaged when it was moved in the 17th century and reframed. And the model on the left from the Victorian Albert Museum, which you can see in the exhibition, gives us a better idea of what the original composition was like. And you can see that this, when you remove the Baroque frame and concentrate on the center of the relief, what we have is something quite amazing, namely life-size figures gathered in this extremely dynamic composition and nothing like this had ever been made before, and nothing like this was to be made again until sometime in the 17th century. 
Uh, the quality of the carving is also sublime. If you look at the extremely beautiful carving and deep carving of the folds of the drapery or the very subtle and soft depiction of Christ's face, you can see that this is a work of really the highest quality and the greatest ambition. Another example of his innovativeness in the treatment of the tomb was the tomb he made for Lorenzo de' Medici's father and uncle. Now this is a massive work in the uh, Church of San Lorenzo, and again, nothing had been, ever been made like it before. So to give you a sense of how big it is, uh, if you're standing in front of it, your head comes to about here. And a number of things about this were totally new. One was the incorporation of large bits of porphyry, which was this uh, very precious stone that uh, was super hard, and no one knew how to cut it. The ability to cut it had been lost. So incorporating large sheets of it into the tomb was something that was a demonstration of uh, great technical ability. And the, the casting of the bronze elements is also truly extraordinary and truly far beyond anything that had been done before and was not to be equaled again until the sometime in the 17th century. So if you look at it's quite ravishing in, its, in the fineness of the detailing and also the kind of the sense of the vibrancy of the surface and the uh, vital tension of the, of the elements. It's really um, a work of the greatest quality and was hailed as such at its time. Another important element in Verrocchio's character as an artist was his desire to always surpass what had been done before and what he had done before. So we can see this very clearly in the statue of the Christ in St. Thomas. And to see how um, fundamental this drive was in Verrocchio, we can compare the two statues because the two statues were made almost 10 years apart. Even though he had finished the plan for them sometime in the mid 1460s, the making of the statues was so laborious that it ended up uh, taking seven, 16 years total, and uh, the two bronzes were cast years apart. And they're very different in character. So you can see how the drapery in the St. Thomas has become much more complex and much more elaborate. And, to, and it has certain effects that are really quite beautiful. So one of the effects that's so remarkable about it is if you look at the drapery, not only does it have this, these elements, the virtuosic elements of elaboration everywhere, but it also has this remarkable sense of, of you can feel the softness of the fabric, you can feel the, the drape, the way, the pull of it, um, and uh, this had never, something like this had never been done before. Another thing that's quite amazing about this statue is the deep, recesses and crevices that are throughout the sculpture because when you're making a bronze, the more crevices you put into the, the sculpture, the more difficult it becomes to cast. And yet throughout the statue, wherever you go, there are deep recesses. Just to give one example, on St. Thomas's chest is this deep fold that's turned away from the viewer, so no one could even see this. And this fold is so, um, we put a probe in there, and it's something like two inches deep. So, I mean, he just had this drive to make everything as difficult uh, for himself as possible as a way of overcoming the difficulty. He loved overcoming difficulty and displaying his ability to conquer any task. Another thing that's quite incredible about the statue and very characteristic of him is his relentless drive to achieve an aesthetic effect. And in the hair of St. Thomas, he has planned every single curl. And he's planned every single curl in, in relation to every other curl and every group of curls in relation to every other group of curls. And again, there are recesses throughout the head which uh, increase the difficulty of making the piece. And it's important to recall that given the limited technology in bronze casting at the time, that the more elaborate he made it, the more difficult it became to cast. So every curl had to be made in the wax 
And then after the casting, every single curl had to be individually chased with steel tools and chisels and the like. And it's very characteristic of him that as you walk around the head, it, it never, he, he never lets go. He just keeps on going and making it more. He, he has to pursue his aesthetic ambition relentlessly as he moves around the head. And even on the back side of the head, which was never seen by anyone, he barely, he, there, so the curls are a little bit looser and they're a little bit rougher, more uh, roughly chased, but there's hardly any lessening of effort. So this side of the sculpture was never seen until the end of the 20th century. And you can see that even on this side, he, is, he, he doesn't let go. He's a man who's in the grip of an artistic vision. So even though he is realizing uh, new uh, ends as an artist, he does not lose sight of his primary mission, which is to uh, illustrate a miracle and a moment of epiphany, of revelation, and to do so with great emotional impact. As I mentioned at the outset, when the statue was unveiled, it was said to be the most beautiful portrait of Christ ever. And in the 16th century, Vasari, writing about it, comments about the sense of love that you can see between the two figures. Verrocchio's pursuit of emotional um, power in narrative and his desire to achieve uh, great detailing in his works is also very much on view in this fabulous silver relief. And just to unpack it for a second, so here you have the, uh, you know, the, the beheading of, here's St. John is being behead, about to be beheaded by the executioner there. But what's, one of the things that's so remarkable about it is that as you read the relief from right to left, you see this constant change in the emotions that are being described. So here we have these faces of anger and conflict. Here we have this kind of grim determination by the executioner. Here we have uh, three uh, soldiers who seem to be uh, in a moment of anxious anticipation. And here we have this kind of resigned humility. It's very much like Verrocchio that he wants to pursue all of these different, he wants to pursue this powerful display of these different emotions and combine them all in one narrative. We have these fabulous photographs of the heads of the statues, which help us see even better what uh, he was doing here. And it's also worthy of note the, the incredible precision in some of the detailing. And remember that these figures are something like, uh, I don't know, about that big. And one of the details that I'm struck by is something that Verrocchio did, which no one else has ever done in uh, a statue of this kind, which is to include in the lips the, these little tiny little folds in your lip that every human has, and which uh, no one else ever bothered to depict. So here again, we have a similar face. And in the executioner, he even seems to facet the eye in a way to indicate the, the iridescence of the iris. And there you can see by contrast the great sense of sort of calm, accepting humility of the saint. The detailing of the, ar the armor is also extraordinary in its finish. There, nothing like this had been made in the 15th century. He was also a painter of great uh, ability, and the picture which shows perhaps best his uh, capacity as a painter is this one from Berlin, which is in the exhibition. And some of the features to concentrate on when you look at it in the exhibition is the strong uh, depiction of space uh, that's uh, created by the limbs of the baby and the Madonna. Uh, they have this kind of architecture which makes the space easy to read. And this is that uh, clear depiction of space and the firm rotundity of the figures are this kind of sculptural quality are features that have made everyone uh, confident that it is painted by Verrocchio. 
And another feature of the sculpture with painting, which is so remarkable, is the extremely fine depiction, uh, observation and depiction of light in the painting. So when you look at it upstairs, be sure to concentrate on, for example, the glimmer of light in the eye or the, uh, the reflected lights on the underside of her chin or this passage in the veil, which seems to me very beautiful, where you have light passing through the veil and you have light bouncing off the front of the veil and you have the golden thread that is scintillating. Uh, so you have three lighting effects and one, one on top of the other. And you also have this crystal here, which seems to be reflecting the sky and the mountains in the background. And the head of the baby is also quite extraordinary for the uh, three-dimensionality and uh, of it and of every element. So if you look at the eyes, for, the, for example, they have this kind of three-dimensionality, which um, is uh, it, truly exceptional in Florentine painting. Now, as I mentioned at the outset, Verrocchio was a draftsman of great importance. And one area in which this was true was in the use of black chalk. Black chalk today is something we all accept as being a completely common medium, but he was the first artist, so far as we are aware, to understand the capacity and the potential of black chalk and to use it to depict heads with a greater continuity in the modeling and to give the, to give the figures a more convincing and naturalistic three-dimensionality. You can see this when you compare a drawing by Verrocchio with a drawing by uh, his teacher, Lippi, uh, how very different it was. So in the Lippi drawing, it's basically, made, the drawing is made with two different media. So uh, the white is made with uh, gouache and the dark lines are made with metal point. And because it's two different media, there's, uh, even though it does look three-dimensional, there's a gap. Whereas in Verrocchio's uh, drawing, there's a much greater continuity. There's a subtle, infinitely subtle gradation of tone. And this is where the ideas that we all know from Leonardo really begin of the creation of sfumato, this kind of smoky modeling, used to create chiaroscuro, you know, the light, the manipulate the light and dark, and thereby create greater rilievo or three-dimensionality. He was also a dazzling uh, artist in pen and ink, and his pen and ink drawings were very influential on both Leonardo and Raphael. And um, we, you can see why, how, how innovative he was if we compare a drawing by Verrocchio with a drawing by Mazzo Finaguerra, who was one of the great draftsmen in Florence uh, and just a little bit older than uh, Verrocchio. So the drawing on the right is about 1460 and the drawing on the left about 10 years later. And you can see how much more uh, dynamic and uh, convincingly volumetric Verrocchio's figure is. A third element that was important in Verrocchio as a draftsman was his creation in the studio of a new form of making drapery studies, which involved painting on linen. And uh, this was very important, again, for the creation of three, chiaroscuro and rilievo, and very important for Leonardo's formation. Just to speak a little bit further about Verrocchio and Leonardo. So you can see how deep Verrocchio's influence was on Leonardo when we look at this head study of a woman with beautiful hair on the left. And we know from Vasari that Leonardo loved these head studies and, and owned them, owned examples of them. And here we can see a, an example of Leonardo drawing uh, a work in this manner some 30 years later that, uh, you know, still looking back to Verrocchio. Another point of very close connection between them is the Lady with Flowers and the Ginevra de Benci. And uh, the works were made at about the same time. And uh, they're so close in many elements that for a long time it was suggested that they could even depict the same woman, though that is generally not believed anymore. 
Another example that shows how much Leonardo learned from Verrocchio is this comparison of the, the, of the sculpture on the right from the late 1470s or around 1480, well, we don't know exactly, and the drawing on the right, which is one of uh, Leonardo's drawings of a Madonna and a child holding a cat, or the child playing with a cat, and you can see how the relationship of the animal and the child is so closely related to uh, what Verrocchio was doing. Perhaps another comparison which shows how much Leonardo got from Verrocchio is this of the Christ and St. Thomas and Leonardo's Madonna of the Rocks. So Verrocchio began this in 1467 and finished it in June of 1483. The Madonna of the Rocks was begun in April of 1483. So the Madonna of the Rocks was begun two months before Verrocchio finished his uh, sculpture, and you can see a similar way that the figures are bound together by their movement and by the space around them. So at the outset, I asked, what is it about Verrocchio that brings us together today? And there are a number of points, but there, I think there are three points that in particular make him an artist that we still uh, admire. And one is the innovativeness in uh, conception and technique that uh, characterizes his art. Another is his unprecedented attention and fidelity in the observation and description of many details and perhaps particularly details of light. And a third is his uh, subtle but profound depiction of emotion and were called the movements of the mind. And so I think these are three of the characteristics that m unite all of his art, which, and which we can see in the exhibition above and um, continue to enjoy today. So thank you.